And for those of you who are new to Revolution Church, we are in the Gospel of Luke. We like to study books of Bible at the time. Come on up, Miss Chenna. She's going to be our scripture reader this morning. And again, if you have any questions about this message or about the Bible, maybe something that's been bothering you, feel free to text it in anytime. That goes for all of you watching online this morning. You can text that in. There's my number. And so we'd love, welcome questions for you from you later today. How are you doing, Miss Chenda? Great, great. And there's the up on the screen. Y'all listen as Miss Chenda reads God's word for us this morning. Luke 9. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him, which will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I wasn't great at math in high school. I'm sure many of you are surprised by that. <laughs> um, I don't even know if I could spell trigonometry, let alone take the class. But one of the reasons that I know the Bible is the word of God is because, like math, it can appeal to the very simplest minds and the most complicated minds. Whether it's 2 plus 2 is 4 or some crazy math problem that I can't begin to even quote to you. The Bible covers everything in between, just like mathematics. And so there's like an infinite number of possibilities of how much we can learn and grow in God's word. And yet it appeals to little children as well. Didn't our Savior say, you know, bring the little children to me for such as of the kingdom of heaven? And so I'm impressed with that. And, and let me just tell you that, put your seatbelts on this morning. This passage we just read is going to be trigonometry. This is deep, heavy stuff that I don't even fully comprehend. And this was one of the most difficult sermons to prepare for because it's so in-depth. 
In fact, I want to say it this way. The transfiguration, what we just read about, should give us a sense of awe to be in the presence of Jesus and to hear his word. And I hope that's the, the effect that it gives this morning. And I want to also kind of contrast that with the way our culture is going. Our culture is going away from the awe of the word of God and reverence for the word of God. And in our churches today, it's seemingly becoming more about entertainment. Let me give you a really sad example. Just go with tails. Would you like the kicker or receive the Bible? I will receive. So he wins the toss, chooses to receive the Bible. Patterson back with the kick. Oh my goodness! Is that a touchback? Can you even get a touchback? This time in 18 years, there's a touchback for the kickoff. They literally kicked the Word of God. Just utter disrespect in the name of entertainment. And I'm not, you know I'm not saying we shouldn't make our music great and, and that, our, that our sermon shouldn't be interesting and there shouldn't be a sense of doing things with excellence. But man, if we have to bend over so far backwards that we're kicking a Bible and dressing up in football costumes and stuff like that and entertaining people with la- you know, smoke and fog lights and all that stuff like that, we have gotten so far away from the Word of God. And, and I, I'm not anti-megachurch. I think there's some phenomenal megachurches out there that run in thousands because they preach the word of God. And I hope we grow as a church and continue to grow as a church. This year has been a great year for our church. But I am never going to stoop to where I'm doing stuff like that to hopefully keep your attention. If the word of God can't keep your attention, I need to get back on my knees and pray about it more and find a way to deliver it in a way. But I, I'm thankful to be a part of a church that loves the Bible and loves God's word, and we don't have to stoop to things like that. And I'm hoping that the transfiguration, what you're going to learn about here this morning, will make you like, God's word is so amazing, and that Jesus is is truly amazing. This passage right here, we're going to divide it into three sections. There's the Son of God displaying his glory, which is the transfiguration. There's the Savior dispenses of a demon, and the Son of Man delivered to men. So let's jump right in here. Last week, we ended with this verse, but this verse is a transitional verse into this week. Jesus made a prophecy here. He said, but I tell you, truly, there are some standing here, okay, this is as he was teaching and going, and Peter had just said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, there's some standing here that will not taste death, not experience death, until they see the kingdom of God. And atheists like to point at this verse and say, see, Jesus' prophecy didn't come true, so therefore Jesus is, is a liar and he's not the Savior. Well, we learned last week, if you want to go back and listen to it, it's, where it's online. But the kingdom of God, it, Jesus uses it in five different senses in the New Testament. And he didn't mean the literal millennial kingdom where Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom on earth. He meant in the sense that he's presenting the kingdom of God and the experience of the king, kingdom of God. And of course, he already said the kingdom of God is where? Is within you. And he says, as he's preaching the gospel, the kingdom of God is already at hand. So the kingdom of God is like the already and the not yet. It comes in different phases. So this doesn't mean that Jesus was wrong. They were twisting the scriptures, not even listening to Jesus' own words. And it says now about eight days. This is another point, thing where like atheists and Bible skeptics like to say, wait a minute, Matthew and John said it was six days. Luke says eight days. See, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Well, first of all, there's a key word there. Luke says about, okay? So if you say, hey, we were gone for about three or four days, am I being giving you a specific number. No, I'm using the word about, but also consider this. Luke is counting the day that he says it and the day that the next thing happened and there's six days in between. So uh, when we say something is standing about something like roundabout, it's on either side of it. So there's a day on either side of it. So when he says about day, eight days, that perfectly fits in with literal six days that the other two gospel preachers were referencing. So again, People try to hold the Bible to a standard that they don't even put on their own uh, words. For example, if you look at your app on your weather today, it will say that sunset is at 718 or whatever time it is. Don't hold me literal there. I was just guessing. But does the sun truly set or does the earth turn? 
We, we still say sunrise, sunset. We say the sun's going down, the sun's coming up. That, and it's, not, it's not doing any of those. We all know, we all passed third grade science class and know the sun doesn't go up and down, but we still say it. A groundhog is not a, a dog uh, or a hog, okay? A prairie dog's not a dog, okay? But we say all these words all the time. Can you imagine uh, people 200 years from now saying, what idiots they were there back then in, in 2024? They said the sun went down and the sun came up. You know, again, they want to scrutinize the Bible and they want to be skeptical of the Bible because they don't want to believe the Bible. Because if you can kick the Bible in the trash can, you don't have to do what it says. And really, that's what it comes down to. I'm going to be the master of my own destiny, not God. I don't need some God telling me what to do. I want to do what I want to do. I want to watch what I want to watch. I want to sleep with who I want to sleep with. I want to spend my money my way. I want to do everything. I want to be the Lord of my own life. And that's the root of the problem. It's not like, oh, there's contradictions in the Bible and all those things like that. That People are, will see what they want to see. So that all that happened after he said this. And so he's connecting the two. In fact, it's very interesting. Matthew, Luke, and John all connect Jesus' prediction about the kingdom with this transfiguration when Jesus' parents changed. So all three connected the two events, the statement with the event. And so I really believe this is what Jesus is talking about. He says, you, none of, some of you won't die until you see the kingdom of God revealed in my transfiguration. I think that's what's making abundantly clear through the three gospels. So it says he took with him Peter, John, and James. Have you ever noticed that in all the lists of the disciples, whether it's a few of them or all 12, who is always listed first? Peter is. God had big plans for Peter. And you see that Peter was the one on Pentecost, stood up preaching and was bold when only days earlier... He was like, oh, who's Jesus? I don't know him. You know, I, denying him totally, okay? But now through the Holy Spirit of God, he's preaching the word of God with boldness before men who were threatening to kill him. And so that you see that change there. And as Peter, John, and James, this is the inner circle that Jesus had. Jesus had many disciples, right? Hundreds and hundreds of them. Then he had the 120, there was the 70, there was the 12, and then there was the three. It's been said that everybody needs to have their three. A small group, a discipleship group, friends who get together occasionally, but people who love the Lord Jesus like you do and will help you in that growing process together. So that's why I encourage you to get a part of a Wednesday night group or a Tuesday night group or one of these groups and get connected to people. Even Jesus had his Peter, James, and John to help him grow in Christ. And it says they went up on a mountain to pray. You, you, you think about how brief the details of the gospel are compared to all that Jesus actually did, right? John says, if we were to record everything that Jesus did, the books of this world cannot contain them. But yet, it repeats over and over again, Jesus took time to pray. If your ministry on earth was only going to be three and a half years, you think you'd be as busy as possible, working seven days a week, going, 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 because you've got to change the world in three and a half years. But how many times, over and over again, Jesus says, you know what? Let's go away. Let's pray. Jesus was showing you and Jesus was showing Gary, we have to depend on, upon the Holy Spirit of God to do the miraculous, to do the supernatural. That Jesus himself is setting that example for all of us to follow, to take time to pray. And then watch this. As he was praying, a lot of good things happen while you're praying, amen? Uh, well, as he was, that was weak. A lot of good things happen while we're praying, amen? All right, good, good. You guys are awake. Okay, more coffee, please. It says the appearance of his face was altered, okay? And it tells us how it was altered. He, he started to shine brightly. And it says, and his clothing became dazzling white. Some translations, the, 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 the Lexham uh, English Bible says, his clothing became gleaming like lightning. This word can be translated different ways. Think about how bright lightning was, is. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing and it says his clothes were glowing like that with, with that effect of lightning. And you, so where are they? They're up on a mountain. Jesus' face does what? It changes. It becomes bright. His clothes become bright. The, does any of this sound familiar? I mean, let's walk through all that's happening here. High mountain, took three leaders with him. The cloud covers the mountain. There's the glory of God comes down. Uh, his face becomes bright. The glory settles. I heard somebody got it over there. And after six days, God speaks. And what did you say over here? 
Moses, right. When Moses received the law, he was up on a high mountain, and all of this applies to that. This is definitely a hyperlink back to that event. Of course, Moses was on Mount Sinai, and I believe Jesus is on Mount Horeb. Different people debate that. Moses took Joshua, Aaron, and Hur. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. The cloud was mentioned in both passages. The glory of God was mentioned in both passages. His face becomes bright. You know, uh, it's interesting. Moses' fa face became bright because he absorbed the glory of God. Remember those old toys we used to get that were like that funny color green? And you'd put them under a lamp. And then when you turn them off the light, what would happen? Yeah, they wouldn't glow though until you put them under the light for a while. They had to absorb the light and then they could glow in the dark. Moses absorbed the, the light or reflected it like the moon reflects the sun, but Jesus didn't have to absorb any glory. He was the glory. He's like the sun. He has his own light. Moses was like the moon. And then we continue with the comparison. So the glory settles on, and not only does it cover, now it settles on the mountain. And then after six days, God speaks and gives the law. This is an incredibly clear hyperlink back to this story. And this is like one of the most important stories to Jews. This is like, wow, the giving of the law? They, they were, they, they were, this was something they were truly in awe of. This was a, a magnific magnificent event. I mean, there, this wasn't just any old cloud. This was a cloud that was just like, wow, like one of those storms coming in, but it's glowing. Lightning is going all over the place and everything is smoking. And then Moses comes down and his face is glowing and the people are like terrified of it. And what do they ask him to do? put a veil over his face. It's like, you're freaking us out, Moses. And it, it was scaring them how, how much glory was going on, not only here with the giving of the law, with his face, but all that was ha happening on the mountain. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. And so my question is, did Moses and Elijah have t-shirts on? It said Moses, Elijah. I mean, had they ever met these guys in person? No. I, how would they even know who these guys were? Well, it says that they were talking. So I imagine Moses is saying, yeah, remember that time you gave me the law of Jesus when you were there and you were on the mountain? And Elijah saying, yeah, remember Jesus when I called down fire from heaven? I think based on their conversation, that's how they knew who these guys were. But then, again, that's just a fun speculation there. Do you remember what Moses' consequences were for striking the rock in anger? And now, where is he standing in the promised land? That, that, that discipline was only temporary. I always felt bad for Moses forever. Like, yeah, he did all that work leading all these knucklehead people through the wilderness. They're the ones griping and complaining. He was even willing to lay down his life for them and say, Lord, kill me instead of them. And now one incident, which I'm not trying to minimize it because it was that rock was Christ. So he smites the rock a second time and God says, you're not going to the promised land. I said, man, that's harsh. But God's like, no. Give him a couple thousand years, he'll be there. <laughs> and there, here he is there in person with the Lord Jesus and with Elijah. And so there they all are. And the disciples are witnessing this whole thing happening on this mountain. And again, it's just a beautiful hyperlink back to this very important story. And it says that, uh, they, that all these guys appeared in glory. So they're in their glorified bodies is what I think this also means. Not just the glory cloud, but how are they even able to physically be there when they're dead and gone? Well, again, they're in their glorified bodies. Of course, um, Elijah actually never died, right? The Bible says what happened to him? He was caught up in a whirlwind. So it's appointed unto man once to die. And so I'm getting a little prophecy here for you. But I believe that when the two prophets come back to the tribulation, Elijah is one of them and he will die then. He'll keep his appointment. Moses, was bo his body was buried, but nobody knows where because who buried him? God did, okay? And so... Um, you just think of all this thing that's going on, but both of them somehow are appearing in their glorified state, and yet the disciples recognize them by what they say. And so we have that same promise. Did you know that? Philippians chapter 3 says, We eagerly await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our humble body. Our body's humble, amen? Our humble body to be what? Conformed to his glorious body. This body that with all its aches and pains and all the different issues we have, will someday be glorified and become like the body of Jesus Christ. First, First John tells us why. We know that when he appears, talk about the second coming of Christ, which he's coming, I believe, sooner, more now than ever. When he appears, we shall be like him. 
So the moment you see the Lord Jesus appear saying, come up hither, we're changed. Why are we changed? Because we see him. Why was Moses' face changed when he was receiving the Ten Commandments? Because he saw the Lord, saw his glory. Again, he didn't see him in his fullness. Why will you and I be changed? Because we will see Christ and it will change us from head to toe in a glorified body like Moses and Elijah were standing there. It's interesting that when they appeared in the glory, Jesus spoke to them of Moses and Elijah about his departure. The word departure here is really an unfortunate translation because the Greek word here is the same Hebrew word meaning exodus. Who led the exodus in the Old Testament? Moses did. He led people out of the bonds of slavery into the promised land or to the edge of it. Jesus leads us out of the bonds of sin into the promised land of salvation. And so Moses is talking about the, the exodus and Jesus, oh yeah, well, I got my exodus coming up too. I'm going to die on the cross for these people and I'm going to lead them out of the bonds of sin into the promised land. And so he's talking about his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Jesus accomplished a lot on earth, amen? He fed the 5,000, which was more like 20-something thousand. He did that miracle twice. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He healed the sick, the blind, the lepers, you name it. And all those are wonderful accomplishments, but the greatest accomplishment Jesus has ever done and is for you and I when he died on the cross, was buried, and he rose again. Nobody has done anything like it before or since. That's why Christianity is true, because Jesus Christ, the founder of Christianity, rose from the dead. Has anybody else done that? No. And so a man who rises from the dead, who predicts his own death, how they will kill them, who will kill them, when they will kill them, and that three days later he rises from the dead, that is the greatest event of all of history. We say this is 2024 because 20, 2,024 years ago he was born. A lot of people think A.D. means after death. It doesn't. Okay, it's Anno Domine, which means the year of our Lord, the year Jesus Christ was born. He came into this world to change the world. And he even changed our calendar and everything in between. So it's now Peter and those who are with him. I don't know what's going on here with Luke, but now he doesn't even mention James and John's by name. I don't know. I guess it's because Peter's listed first. And now Peter's the main focus of this because Peter's the one that's about to speak. But they're very heavy with sleep. What's another time in the Bible where they're really heavy with sleep? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Good for y'all. And here, let's cut them some slack. I think they've been praying all night. When they went up this mountain to pray, first of all, climbing a mountain is a lot of work. Okay? Uh, those of you who have been to Colorado know that. You know the air gets thin, all that stuff. And so they're climbing up to a decent elevation here, not near Denver or anything like that. But they're climbing. They've been up there. They've been up all night. They've been praying. And they're tired. But Jesus is still awake, and he's having a conversation with Moses and Elijah, and they wake up. And when they, they became fully awake, they saw his glory. And it's interesting, I don't, want, I don't want to spiritualize this, except that Paul does. Later, Paul talks about, hey, wake, you sleepers. Realize it's getting dark, and the world is getting dark around you. You need to wake up and realize we got to get the gospel out there. And so this is a call to us that when we become fully awake, we see more of the glory of God and we need to take the great commission and sharing Christ and changing the world more seriously. And they, they woke up and are like, wait a minute. Is that, I see Jesus and I see two people. Am I seeing triple vision here? What's going on? And then they're looking closer and then they're hearing their conversation like, no way. That's Moses. Listen to what he's saying. Oh my gosh, that's Elijah. And they're, they're seeing the heroes of the faith right here in person with Jesus. And as the men were parting from him, so Moses and Elijah said, okay, Jesus, we'll see you later. We're going away. And so Peter says to him, Master, hold on, stop them. It, you know, it's really good that we're here. And it, he's celebrating the moment. And we give Peter a hard time because many times Peter, before he speaks, has to take his foot out of his mouth. I'm not sure this is one of those cases as I've studied it this week. Let me tell you why. He says, let us make three tents. Now, tents is often translated what else? tabernacles. What did the nation of Israel, what's their next big project after Moses came down from the mountain? The next big project is the building of the tabernacle. Peter's actually tracking with what's happening here. He's seeing the hyperlink. He's like, hey, Moses and all led the people, told them to gather the gold, the silver, all the jewels, and all the, the things, the parts to assemble a tabernacle. This is that. This is like Mount Sinai. Let's build tabernacles. So Peter's actually on the right track 
But that, actually, it's much, even much bigger than that. So I don't think Peter's saying, hey, let's worship these three guys. They're all equal. But I don't think he will see how much head and shoulders Jesus is above them yet. But he is seeing it. He's on the right track. What was the next big thing after the giving the law of Moses? Again, it was building the tabernacle, as you'll find in Exodus 26. All this other stuff just happened in Exodus 23, 24, and 25. So he says, let us make three tents or tabernacles for you, for Moses and Elijah. And then there's this parenthetical thought here, not knowing what he said. And again, people, including me, have read this in the past saying, Peter, there you go, putting your foot in your mouth again. I think he doesn't even really fully appreciate how significant what he just said was. That he is really is tracking with the glory of God. But again, it's even much bigger than even he thinks. And in the middle of him talking, as he was saying these things, a cloud came down, overshadowed them. You ever been in such a dense fog, like you're driving, that you have to slow down like 5, 10 miles per hour? Because you can't hardly see anything. This is how thick this was, I believe, that it overshadowed them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Now, give them credit. They're entering the cloud. But why? Are they afraid? Anybody remember from Mount Sinai? What would happen if you even touched the mountain? You died. And they're thinking, oh my gosh, we could die from this. But the Lord's talking to us. Let's go in. I'm in. Who's in? And I'm sure Peter was the one who went first, just like he was the first to go and walk on the water. And so Exodus 19, 12 says, and you shall set limits for the people all around, all around this mountain. Take care that you don't go up into the mountain or even touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. That's why they're afraid. But yet they entered in anyway. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this, this is my God voice. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Three phrases that are all, again, important hyperlinks back to the Old Testament. You see, rabbis had taught uh, for decades and centuries, actually, that that the Messiah would be confirmed from all three parts of the Old Testament. What are the three parts of the Old Testament? There's the writings, which is Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, all those things. There's the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, Obadiah, all those major and minor prophets. And then there's the law, which is how, the first how many books? Five. Yeah, gave you a little subtle hint there. So, you look, so here in the writings, from Psalm 2, he quotes, this is my son. And then... From the prophets, he talks about my chosen one from Isaiah 42 and in several other places. I'm just giving you one sample. And then he says, listen to him over and over in Deuteronomy. It says, hear, O Israel, listen to the Lord your God. Listen to his commandments. And he's putting all three parts of the Old Testament saying, yep, this is the Messiah. And all the rabbis should have caught on and said, yeah, look, it just got fulfilled there. But some believed, but most did not. Matthew 3.16 says, And when Jesus was baptized, behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, a voice from heaven confirms that. And then here towards the end of the ministry, God puts his seal on that. You see the chiastic structure there, the beginning and the end, all confirming, all pointing to who Jesus is, that he truly is the Messiah, the anointed one to come. John 5 says this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to what? To kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath, but he was even calling his own God, his own father, read this last part with me, making himself equal with God. You see, people say, well, like the Mormons, Jehovah's Witness and other cults and other denominations will say, well, there's God the Father, but then Jesus is just God the Son. He's a lower, lesser God. That's like saying lower, lesser, perfect. How can you have a lower, lesser, perfect? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all equally God. We believe in one God, distinctly expressed and eternally in three persons, all equal. Jesus is not a lesser God. In fact, the Jews multiple times wanted to kill him for blasphemy because he claimed to be equal with God. So when people say, well, the Jesus never said I was God or I was equal with God. I, I want to know which Bible are you reading? Are you, you're doing selective reading is what the problem is. But John and Peter, they refer, both John and Peter refer to this transfiguration later in their writings. Let's look, <clears throat> John in chapter one, at the beginning, he says, you know, that's where he says in verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then he says, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's obviously talking about Jesus. The whole chapter is, and we have seen his glory. 
John's talking about the transfiguration. We saw, you know, most of the time he just walked around in flesh and bone and blood, and he was just normal looking. But then all of a sudden there was that one time that he just glowed, and, it, and he wasn't glowing because he had encountered God. He glowed because he was God. And it says, as the only son from the Father, and there's a reference to the quote, full of grace and truth. Peter also references the transfiguration. He says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths, this isn't just a bunch of myths and fables. And Peter's saying this only decades after the, the resurrection, okay? So people have this whole idea that, that um, the Council of Nine C and, and, and all those other councils later, they declared Jesus was God after hundreds of years of legend and myth. This was all happening right there at the same time. In fact, 1 Corinthians, Paul, only 20 years after the resurrection, writes about the resurrection being literal and names witnesses, eyewitnesses. And he says, we're not following devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And again, this is a, re a reference to the transfiguration. And so what does he say? This is my son. Listen to him. Listen to him. And the question we cannot leave here today without asking is, am I listening to the Lord? You know, our, our missionary friend, Jeff, talked about listen to God. Is he calling you to do something? Calling you to be a lawyer, calling you to be an accountant, calling to be a missionary, a pastor, whatever it is. God can call you to any of those things. Are you listening? Are you even asking or opening up your ears to ask God to speak and, and make that clear to you? Tim Keller gives us four practical points from this same passage here. He says that we should, number one, here we go, we should pray into reality. All of this happened because Jesus took them up on the mountain to pray. Don't underestimate the, pr pr the priority of prayer. Every good thing God has done for Revolution Church has been a result of God's people praying. The fact that we're here in this building, the fact that many of you are here uh, for different reasons. You can say, man, I, God just orchestrated this where this happened and this happened and next thing I'm here. And so all these things about praying into the reality of what God is doing in the world. Number two, come in community. Jesus didn't ask Peter to come by himself. He brought the three. Those four guys, Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they experienced this all together. And don't you know that for years to come, they were talking about this before they went their separate ways, about a wonderful experience that this was? They did it in community. Because let me tell you something. When you discuss the Word of God in a small group, there are guaranteed other people will see something in the Word that you did not see, and that God is using them to reveal that to you. We need each other. We, in our Western mindset, we think of, oh, I'm going to do my devotions by myself. I'm going to pray by myself. I'm walking with God by myself. Oh, thank God that you have me because I'm like the only one. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times for closet prayer and personal devotions. But that is just as important as the time we come in the community and study with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Number three, rest in family. God the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And here's the great mind-blowing thing of all eternity that he calls us daughters and sons to. I could see why he'd call Jesus that. I mean, look at all he did. Golly, I mean, he gets to call God his father. But you and I get to do that same thing that we get to say the God who made the universe is our heavenly father. Now, some of you, that doesn't resonate much with you because your dad wasn't that good of a dad. That would be me. My dad and I were like, literally, if I, when I got home from school, you know, I'd be after, watching after school cartoons or whatever like that. As soon as I heard a, the car pull in the driveway, I peeked out the window. If it was my dad, I was out the back door and gone as far as I could get from home. Okay, now he didn't beat me or do anything horrible like that, but I just didn't get along. And I'm thankful that God gives us a second chance at the father-son relationship through him. Now, for those of you who have like had an amazing dad, just think about how much that means to you and then how much more the Heavenly Father loves you. And if you can imagine anybody loving you more than that your dad loves you, man, that's why that, that's so important. And you can just rest in that. Like, you know, God says, I'm beloved too. I'm well pleased. Like, oh. And I, I struggle with this where I'm like, oh, yes, he's in my Heavenly Father, but I know he's constantly disappointed because of all my mistakes. No, he's not. He looks at me, and he sees Christ. That's all he sees. That's all he sees. As far as east is from west, your sins he's forgotten. 
He looks at you. He loves you. That's all he sees. Just like, and I, I don't even feel worthy to even say this, but God looks at us and says, this is my beloved child in who I am well pleased. He says that about you. That, that should just blow your life away right there. We need to rest in that. And not, who cares what others think about you? God says he's well pleased. And then number four, submit to authority. Listen to him. If, if you put together the first three, how could you not do number four? How do you not submit to his authority and say, hey, Lord, here I am. Send me. Here I am. What would you have me to do? Monday morning, wake up. God, this day is yours. What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to talk to? How do you want me to respond? What do you want me to read? I want to do my job the way it pleases you. I want to speak to others the way it pleases you. Verse 36 is, and when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. So the cloud comes down. They can hardly see each other through the fog. There's still some glowing going up there. But then the cloud lifts. Moses and Elijah are gone, and Jesus is found alone. In fact, another translation says it in a way that I think is more profound. They saw only Jesus. Only Jesus. And that's super important. This is a profound theological statement right here because only Jesus is all that matters. You see, when you consider who is able to save you, only Jesus. You can't save yourself. Your church can't save you. I can't save you. Nobody can save you. Only Christ can save you. Not Buddha, not Allah. Nobody else in this universe can save you. It's only Jesus. Who is, was willing to die for you? Only Jesus. He's the only one that matters. What, who should you put your faith in today? Only Jesus. And who is worthy to give your life to? Only Jesus. You see, only Jesus. For some time, they had kept quiet and they did not say anything about what they had seen. Now, John 17 tells us why, like Jesus had this pattern of doing. What, did, what would he often do after a miracle? Shh, we'll tell you why. And of course, we know because Jesus was trying to control the timetable as to when the crucifixion would happen because the faster news spread, the faster it became political, the faster they wanted to crucify him. So he was trying to control the timetable there by not having people talk about it. So we saw the Son of God displaying his glory, and now we see the Savior dispenses a demon. You think, what kind of random story is this? Here's this amazing transfiguration, and they come down and cast out the demon out of a boy. There is a connection. Luke knows what he's doing. So on the next day, he lets, he's giving you the timetable. This is like back-to-back -back bookends here. When they had come down from the mountain, so they were there for another, they were there overnight, so now it's another day, and they're coming down from the mountain, and this is what happens next. Behold, a man from the crowd. It's interesting that often the time the Bible will name people, here it doesn't name them, and I'm not exactly sure why, except it's saying that God could, Jesus could have done this for anybody. He was willing to do this for anybody, so here's just a, an anybody in the crowd, cries out, says, teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. Do you think that detail matters? Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. There's a link going on here as well. That's why this story matters. The voice from heaven had just said, this is my beloved son. And now this man's come and say, Father, I mean, Jesus, here's my only beloved son suffering. And that's, that's pointing to the crucifixion. He, and so he says it's his only son because you, because if you go back to Luke 8, we just studied this a few weeks ago. Jairus had a 12-year-old daughter, and he said, this is my only daughter. Do you see the pattern here? Uh, and so now he's saying, this is my only child. I think I skipped one here. Anyway, there was multiple times where he talks about an only child, and this is another one like it right there. And so now we go, and he tells them all the details. Of, Look at all these horrible things that are happening to this child. And the word child here means between toddler and teenager. So this is seven, eight, nine-year-old. We don't really know. But can you imagine going through this? Seizures, crying out in pain, I'm sure, convulsions, foaming at the mouth, and it shatters him. The word shatter here means like you take a piece of pottery and just smash it on the ground. This is what the demon was doing. Then, of course, it says it. The demon threw him on the ground one more time. And it says he will hardly leave him alone. This wasn't something that happened like once a week, twice a week. It was like all day, every day, and he rarely got a break. This little boy hardly ever got a break. I mean, it was probably difficult to eat, difficult to do anything, because this demon was ruthless and relentless. And, it, and he was suffering from all this. And the family didn't get a break either. And he says, I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. It doesn't say that they would not. They could not. 
Now, there's different things about this. There's some passages that say this type only comes out with prayer and fasting, and that's definitely a factor, but why? Why would this one be more intense? Well, Ephesians tells us that the darkness of spiritual realm has levels of intensity. There's rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers. Just like the Roman government was divided into three levels, Paul's making an allusion to that, saying, hey, the darkness of the world, there's Satan, and he's got levels of archangels or archdemons and levels below that. And so maybe some of the, the demons that the disciples had cast out during their, their journey, where Jesus empowered to do that, were lower level, and now this was a higher level one. We really don't know, but we don't want to mess with these things, that's for sure. And he says, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Why don't you tell us what you really think, Jesus? <laughs> this is pretty harsh. He's only on earth for three and a half years, and it's already it's too long. I mean, he's like, and he's just being really frustrated with their lack of faith. He's like, how long do I have to be with you? I didn't put up with you. And I, I, wanted, I, I looked at this first. I like, who was he talking to? Because a lot of times when Jesus would say, oh, wicked generation, he was talking to the crowd. But Matthew tells us he was talking to the disciples. So it answers that question. And he's really frustrated with their lack of faith because here they're experiencing the teaching of Jesus, the word of God of Je is Jesus, the word who became flesh and dwelt among us, um, among us, and they're still having their doubts, they're still confused, and they're still not able to cast this one out. And then he says, then he turns his direction to the man and says, bring your son here. So while he was coming, so this boy is coming. I don't think he's being dragged to him. The father is willing to bring him. The son is coming. But while he's doing this, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. So here comes another one of these seizures again. Again, not all seizures are epileptic fixed or demonic. In fact, most are probably not, but sometimes they are. And this is definitely one of them. The Bible makes a clear distinction between sickness and the demonic, and they're not all the, always the same. He says, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And this is a picture of the gospel. Here's the only son who is suffering and then is healed and given back to the father. Jesus would suffer on the cross for us, be buried, and then would return after 40 days to his father. What did Moses discover when he came down from the mountain? Do you remember? Yeah, they'd created a golden calf and uh they had just started worshiping demons right there. I mean, while he's up on the hill, they discovered, he discovered idol worship, which always involves the demonic. They melted the idol into the fire. They ground the pieces to powder and they cast it on the water. What was this demon doing to this little boy? Lord, I have mercy on my son for he, Matthew tells us the details. He has seizures. He suffers terribly. He falls into the fire and often into the water. And of course, Luke says he's shattered. Just like they shattered the golden calf, ground it into pieces, took the, put it through the fire, and then sprinkled it on the water, this demon possession is exactly what is going through with the idol. It's, a, it's another amazing hyperlink back to Mount Sinai and what happened afterwards. So, and all of them were astonished at the majesty of God. They're like, man, every little detail, God, you just know it all. You're orchestrating history. Now, it'd be one thing for you and I to write a book, like a novel or fiction, and hyperlink all these stories. This isn't just stories. This was history, people's lives. And God is showing how sovereign he is that every little choice that Moses, Aaron, her made, Peter, James, John, everything they did, God was totally in control, showing how sovereign he is. And they're like, man, our God is majestic. He is amazing. And so we've seen the Son of God displaying his glory at the transfiguration, the Savior dispensing with this demon. And then we bring to the third and final point, the Son of Man, deli the Son of Man delivered to men. And that's the title Jesus gave himself. It says, while they were all marveling, and I hope that we marvel at the word of God, he said, at everything that he was doing. Are, if we're not regularly marveling at Jesus, and this goes for me as well, there's something with our approach to scripture. You know, I, I often, I, I often, I, in over 30 some years of ministry, I've heard people say, well, I'm just not being fed. And I'm like, Every single week I'd stay for the word of God, I, I discover something new. I'm like, wow, look at that, look at that. And I mean, I, I have a degree in theology and I've been studying since I was nine years old and every week I'm blown away by the word of God. And I'm like, some people are like, eh, I'm just not growing, not being fed. I'm like, 
do I need to spoon feed you more? <laughs> you know, you, I mean, behold the word of God and behold the God of the word. We, should, we are blown away. And, and you, if you're not being regularly blown away by the word of God, you need to step back and say, God, clear away all the clutter in my life and help me see you afresh. Help me see the word afresh. Blow me away, Lord. And sometimes we have to dig for golden treasure. It's not always just right there on the surface, but we should be regularly marveling as they did. It says, Jesus said, while they're marveling, Jesus said to, him, to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. And I don't want to read into something that's not there, but I also think the frustration is still there. Hey, you thick scald guys, let this sink deep into your ears because you guys are really thick right now. And I need you to really get this. The Son of Man, which some people think the Son of Man is a lower title than the Son of God. It's actually a higher one. Daniel talks about the Son of Man coming, and he's the glorious one, the Ancient of Days who comes as the Messiah. The Son of Man is the most used reference he has used about himself. He said he's about to be delivered. And we're talking a matter of days here. This is all going to happen. He's going to be delivered. What just happened to that little boy? He just got delivered. Okay, you keep seeing the links right here. He said he's going to be delivered not just to anybody, but to the hands of men, to ruthless men, to un, unsaved men, to torturous men, to Roman soldiers who will mutilate his flesh. Romans 4 says, about, talking about the righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him that raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our transgressions, our trespasses, sorry, and raised for our justification. So, but they didn't understand what he was saying. Even though he's getting on to them for the lack of faith, he said, hey, you know, let this sink deep into your ears. They're not getting it, but, they, but it's not totally their fault. Look what it says here, because it was concealed from them. Do you realize if God was to show you all you need to know right now, your mind would probably explode. <laughs> he does it in phases. He conceals things. And there's, there's times where you read the Bible like, why didn't I see that before? It's because God wants you to learn things in layers. So this is an ongoing relationship with him. And it says, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Why? Why would they be afraid to ask? Well, they already probably feel kind of stupid. <laughs> they just got been, they just been called a faithless generation <laughs> They've just been told, let this sink deep into your ears. And like, it's not. I am a typical husband. It's just flying right over my head. I, I don't know what you're saying. And maybe, but the reason not to ask, maybe pride. Maybe there's some things we don't understand about God's word. Ask someone. Do a little research. Maybe it's pride that keeps us from doing that. And it says, let these words sink deep into your ears. You're about to be delivered. It's, all this was about to happen soon. Sorry, let me go forward here. This is why Jesus suffered. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. He had to bleed. He had to be beaten. He had to have nails through his hands and feet and a crown on his head because his blood would wash away our sins. And all of that led to the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Acts chapter 3 tells us to repent, therefore. If you're lost here today, you don't know Christ personally, He's saying, turn away from everything you've, you've, you've done in the past. Turn away from your attempts to save yourself and thinking that you're a good person and turn to Christ that he may blot out your sins. It says if, in Romans 10, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be what? You'll be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the punishment of your sins, which all of us deeply deserve. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Do you know him personally? With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, I want you to pray with me. And I want believers praying that God would open the eyes of lost people. And I just want to pray for them right now. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for this transfiguration and how Jesus displayed his glory. Lord, he wasn't just a great teacher or a prophet or a revolutionary. He was God in human flesh coming to die for our sins and take our place on the cross. So, Father, I pray for anyone today who does not know Christ as Savior, that they would make that decision, that they would step across that line of faith and give their life to Christ because Christ gave their life for them. We thank you for just the majesty of your word and how it blows us away when we dig deep enough. We thank you for Jesus and his amazing sacrifice, and we just give you praise. And all God's people said, amen. If you still have questions about becoming a Christian, there's my number. I'd love to have a conversation with you and answer your questions. 
Um, Ashley, would you like to help me with question and answer? We'll make it short this morning. My sermon is a little longer than normal in communion today, so thank you for bearing with us. But like the missionary said, we need to take our time, right, right ma'am? <laughs> so. I think I accidentally opened one, but there's one. All right. Uh, Acts 2.38 sounds like it's saying we need to be baptized to be saved. Can you explain this verse? Yeah, Acts 2.38 says, um, repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And the church of Christ and the disciples of Christ and like Christian church as a denomination, they all say, see, you need to be baptized to be saved. The key, the, the, the way to understand that verse is the word for. Like if I said I'm going to the store for some milk, I'm going there to get it, right? But if I said that you're going to jail for murder, are you going to jail to get murder or are you going to jail because of murder? Okay. So when the word for, we use it, even today, we use it with different meanings. And the context is king. In that passage here, he's saying, be baptized because your sins have been forgiven, not to get your sins forgiven. So, um, in fact, um, it's interesting. In Acts 10.44, I believe it is, it says the Gentiles received the Holy Ghost. And then later, they were like, have you been baptized since you've received the Holy Spirit? And they're like, No. So they baptize them. How does a lost person get the Holy Spirit without being saved? They can. So they had to be saved and later baptized. So they take a few verses. When there's like 150 some verses in the New Testament, it says all you have to do is believe and be saved. The John 3:16, right? The thief on the cross, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they they will take these few verses out of context to, to say you have to be baptized, be saved. You do not. Okay. I know that Jesus appeared on the earth in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. But does that also mean that it was Jesus' glory Moses saw on Mount Sinai? Was Jesus the one walking with Adam in the garden? Absolutely, because Jesus said it was actually a, a criteria for salvation. He said, unless you believe that I am, you will all perish in your sins. Well, who's the great I am? Who did Moses say? Well, Lord, who, who am I going to say it sent me? He said, I am have sent thee. So Jesus says, I am the I am. So that, that's proof enough. for And there were seven times, at least in the New Testament, where Jesus used the I am phrase to hyperlink him back to Jehovah there with, on Mount Sinai and other places. So Jesus would sometimes have, in the Old Testament, he would be visible as like a person, as like an angel. You could look at him and not die. But Correct. sometimes, like on Mount Sinai, if you looked at him, you would die. I guess I'm trying yes. to understand. Yes, exactly. In fact, that's a good point because remember, what Moses and Elijah both had in common was God show me your glory. And Moses, he hit him in the cleft of the rock, and he just kind of whisked by, and he couldn't see his full glory. He just saw the trail or the tail of his glory. And then Elijah asked for the same thing. He's like, well, you trying to want to be Moses 2.0? And he showed him a whirlwind, but God wasn't in a whirlwind. He showed him a fire, and he wasn't there. And, he was like, and then he said God was in the whisper, the small whisper. He said, I'm going to talk to you differently than I talked to Moses. And that's the great thing. God treats us all as individuals, just like you do your kids, right? That's it. Okay, there was one more down here. There we go. I see it. What Bible verse do you think displays God's power at the highest besides creation and raising him all the other people he raised from the dead? Wow. Great question. Um, so obviously setting creation and resurrection aside, that's the two biggest ones. So if you want to use the miracle that involved the most people, it'd have to be defeating the 5,000. I mean, a lot of other miracles were one-on-one -on -one or just a couple of people or 10 lepers. Here's 20-something thousand people all eating miraculous bread and fish. That's pretty amazing. Um, but I guess I would go one further to take like the apostle, to take Saul and transform his heart into Paul and save his soul, a, a guy who was killing Christians into the greatest spokesman for Christianity besides Jesus. That's pretty amazing miracle right there. He did it after he ascended. Right, so exactly. Like his exactly. Good point. All right, let's stand and let's pray. And uh, Jeff Price, would you thank the Lord for our, what we've done, what the Lord's done for us this morning, and as we're dismissed in prayer.